uh, whenever you ask nature a question, it gives you an answer which is much more subtle and marvelous than anything you could ever think up. And that gives you a kind of humility. You have to look, look at nature and ask, what's it trying to tell you without deciding beforehand? There was just one method, a physical method, X-ray crystallography, which offered any hope of solving the problem, but even that was doubtful, because everybody thought it would never solve the structure as complex a molecule as this. And I thought an, an enormous amount of effort and years of effort would be worthwhile to solve this problem, and I had my mind fixed on, on this of finding a way, you see, finding a way of solving it. I used to carry on with my X-ray pictures day and night, you see, and I would set my alarm and every two hours I would get up and turn my crystal by another three degrees and restart the X-ray tube, take another photograph and so on. The other research students in the lab thought I was crazy to take this on. But then, you see, I reflected that it, hemoglobin may be a thousand times more complex than the structures they were working on, but it was also a thousand times more interesting. Now, you notice two things. The spots are arranged very nicely and regularly, and that merely gives you the distance between the hemoglobin molecules and the crystal. But then you see that the spots have different degrees of blackness. Some are very dark and others are quite faint. And uh, that we call the intensities of the spots. The problem is that uh, measuring the intensities gives you only half the information needed to solve the structure of the crystal. The other half is called the phase. They gave beautiful X-ray diffraction pictures. So those thrilled me enormously, you know, and I would show them to all my friends, say, but look what marvelous X-ray pictures I got from these hemoglobin crystals. And when, but when they asked me what they meant, they would change the subject because I had no idea. You know, having put this tremendous effort into the work, I think I just couldn't face saying it was all in vain. It, it to told me nothing. It, it's just more than you are capable of it to admit to yourself that this was useless. You, you, had, you had to throw it, throw it all, all away. And of, of course, as you, you can imagine, I, I, was, I was very unhappy indeed because I didn't really know what to do next and how to, f to find the true solution. And I noticed that the attaching two mercury atoms to two sulfur atoms in hemoglobin still uh, kept the physiological properties of hemoglobin intact. It still combined with oxygen. So, you know, then uh, the, the penny dropped and I realized if I did this, uh, perhaps uh, I would get an effect. Well, imagine sailing for years through uncharted water and then 
suddenly you see land rising on the horizon. And this model emerging was like this. So one morning in September 1959, our results came out of the computer at the Cambridge University Mathematical Laboratory, thousands of numbers, which we plotted on sheets of paper. And then we drew contours around them, and there emerged a landscape of peaks and valleys. So I built this model and um, suddenly saw this thing, you know, which I had been working on for 22 years. And it was a fantastically exciting moment. I always say it was like reaching the top of a mountain after a very hard climb and falling in love at the same time. And really in, in the intensity of joy and jubilation and admiration, which perhaps only you find only in, in science when nature reveals one of its, its great secrets. So that was marvelous. Then I saw there were four peaks which were bigger than all the others, and I realized that these must be the four atoms of iron, which are in the hemoglobin molecule, and they are attached to a dye called porphyrin, and it's the iron plus the porphyrin which forms the heme, the dye that makes, makes the blood red. But later it was found actually that hemoglobins occur not only in vertebrates, but also in insects, all sorts of other species, even in bacteria. And the remarkable thing is that the fold of the chain is the same in all of these. So, you know, once evolution, as it were, had developed this, it used it over and over again in different animals uh, just to, to deliver oxygen. It soon got around and it was, got this model and lots of people, friends, colleagues came along to see this sort of its uh, wonder of the world. And I wrote up the work for publication in, in Nature and went off on a skiing holiday at Christmas. And I was surprised when I came back because I realized suddenly I'd become famous. And this is the iron atom, which combines with oxygen. There's an oxygen molecule on the same scale, and it would be sitting here. And now the question is, why does the combination with oxygen uh, set off the change of structure of the hemoglobin molecule? And what our maps show was that in the hemoglobin with oxygen, the iron is in the plane of the ring like this. Uh, without oxygen, it moves. I mean, the displacement is minute if you sort of think of our macroscopic world at 200 millions of a centimeter. But you see, in the atomic world, this is a large displacement. And when the iron moves, it also moves the amino acid to which it is linked, which you see here. So this would be moving in and out, and this clearly seemed to be the trigger that set off, off the change in structure. The movement that the displacement of the iron atoms triggers is a rotation of one half of the molecule relative to the other half.